to educate, motivate, and build one another through shared knowledge and success. This is Young and Successful, and these are your hosts, Jay Chukwi, Kenny Awashika, and PJ Luminan. Welcome back to the Yas Daily Show. Our guest today is Dr. Nere. Dr. Nere is the founder of Anadol Center for Foot and Ankle Reconstruction, a comprehensive lower extremity clinic in the Dallas metropolis, where he has practiced for the last five years. He has a special interest in minimally invasive surgery, arthroscopic and endoscopic surgery, arthritis management, lower back extremity, sport injuries, diabetic salvage, and trauma of the foot and ankle. He currently serves as the team foot and ankle surgeon for the Texas Revolution, a professional arena football team in the Dallas Metro, and for the Dallas Rattlers of the Major League Lacrosse. He is a diplomat in the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery, a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, and a fellow of the American Society of Podiatric Surgeons. He is board certified by the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery in both foot and reconstructive rear foot and ankle surgery. Dr. Nyeri currently serves as the chairman of the Department of Podiatric Surgery at the Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. Prior to his move to Texas, he practiced as an assistant clinical professor of the orthopedics at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Dr. Nyeri, thank you for taking the time out to join us today. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. Absolutely, man. How did you like that introduction? Yeah, <laughs> I think it was full glory. Got yet. <laughs> hey, I enjoyed it, man. Thank you for all the accomplishments. It seems like you're a very busy guy. You're out there just getting after it. We try, man. We try. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Well, again, take it away. Yeah, 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 man. It's this. It's, it's it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, we, we we get a lot of requests from 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 viewers of the show about you know. Huh. Do you guys have people in the industry that do health care and how do they accomplish those goals? And, uh, you know, we just thought, hey, we should probably reach out to Dr. Neri and see what he can tell folks about it. Because, you know, growing up as a child, you know, and being surrounded by a lot of pre-med students, everybody drops out. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> drop out. They don't make it to the <laughs> nobody hey. makes it to the finish line. But you made it to the finish line and then you added a couple more to it. Um, not just a couple, a lot more, as you can see with the uh, introduction. So Absolutely. yeah, man, can you please tell us a little bit about your journey? You know, um I know you're still on this journey, you're still going at it, but you know, tell us tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot again and uh, I really appreciate the invitation on your show. You guys are doing an awesome job here with this podcast. It's uh, definitely an inspiration to a lot Thank of young you. entrepreneurs out there. You know, your reach is getting bigger and bigger, and I'm looking forward to see you guys, you know, go to the next level. Maybe your next guest would be Elon Musk. And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, then I can really let him know how I feel. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, my journey is, is, is not atypical by any means. I mean, I, uh, I was a pre-med student, just like uh, Kenny just said. Um, I always wanted to be in the, in the sciences. Arts and sciences was always my passion. Initially, I wanted to be an engineer. And then I got into those calculus classes and I was like, yeah, this, this ain't for me, man. Uh, I, I can't do this long term. So, you know, I was more into the biological sciences. Um, you know, uh, the biologies were, were kind of my forte and I love the human body, you know what I'm saying? At a young age, I knew I wanted to do something with joints. And so, was, you know, kind of deciding, do I want to do something with, you know, big joints or little joints? I was uh, like like most most of us in our in our community. I was you know, an athlete, you know, middle school, high school. I ran track and played soccer, and, and I did the sprints. And towards my senior year in high school, I had a really bad ankle injury. Oh. Probably was an ankle fracture. I never got X-rays, but you know, my ankle was completely dislocated. Um, and ended up having to have rehab on that ankle for a while. And did some research and found out that you know, hey, there are people who subspecialize. And, you know, just foot and ankle. Um, so went to undergrad, did the pre-med then, uh, got a biology degree from University of Louisville, then went on, got my medical degree, uh, came back to Louisville, did my residency. And um, so it was the end of my residency program at University of Louisville. I became real good friends with a hand surgeon. Uh, there was a general surgeon who did a hand fellowship uh, at University of Louisville. When he was a fellow, I was a resident. And we talked, fostered a, a, a good friendship 
and he ended up moving to Dallas and joined the biggest hand hand uh, surgery group in Dallas. Uh, I was in Louisville. I was at University of Louisville and also in private practice. Eight months into my my journey there, I literally got a random call from him saying, "Hey, come check out Dallas. You know, medicine is popping in Texas. There's something to, called tort reform, and we can talk about that later." And he said, hey, I just met this spine surgeon. He's looking to go into more extremities. He's looking for a sports medicine guy and he's looking for a foot and ankle guy. You should, you should talk to him. Uh, so I, you know, I, we prayed about it, talked to the wife, picked up the phone, called the, the spine surgeon. And he said, hey, I would love for you to come um, set up an extremity practice here with somebody else that I'm recruiting from UCLA. I would love for you guys to set up an extremity practice. So I flew down to Dallas, spent a couple of days and the rest is history. I mean, I moved moved down five months later. Started the foot and ankle program for, you know, uh, for his practice and uh, worked there for five years. And then uh, went out on my own, started my own practice, and I've been, you know, doing my own thing for the last couple of years. So that's kind of the short and long of it. That is amazing. Lot. Yeah, I mean, this sounds like one of those situations where, because you know, uh, like my uncle once told me, like success is when. Uh, preparedness meets opportunity Absolutely. right is it one of those situations for you or is it something that you've always had in your mind that you would want to have your own practice one day is it something you've always envisioned and uh how was that for you you know uh, one thing about medicine uh, if you if you kind of look at the average medical um specialty the average medical student even dental students now, unless you come from old money, it's really expensive medical school. The average yeah. medical school graduates with a quarter of a million in debt. You know what I'm saying? I went, Absolutely. Like I'm sure all of y'all did. I went through undergrad without any debt. I had full ride through undergrad. And so when I started medical school, I ain't owe nobody a cent. When I graduated, I was, I was owing 250. You mm -hmm. go from zero debt to a quarter of a million, right? It's a shock. As most of us medical students nowadays, when we graduate from residency, we want to guarantee. So we want to go work for somebody because you don't want to take the risk. Because guess what? The day you finish residency, literally the next day you get a letter from Sally May say, hey, you got to stop paying right now. Oh, you, you don't get six months? Damn. Of that, we don't get no six months. <laughs> you get Dang. <laughs> They're like, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> you high net worth right now and you need to stop paying. You know, and they don't understand that. Listen, a lot of us got families, we got debt, we trying to survive, you know? And so a lot of us, you know, with that shock, especially if you come from a background where you've never had debt before, it's like, yo, it was on me, man. I was like, I got to pay this off right away. And yeah. yet, who's the thoughts, man? Depending on if you, if you had a mentor, you know, you guys are, you know, smart guys and you guys know about money. That's the stuff we don't learn in medical school, but there's two schools of thoughts. When you come out, do you pay yourself first or do you pay your, your debtors first? You know what I'm saying? And in my mind, I wanted to kind of do a hybrid. You know, one of my mentors who was a general surgeon said, hey, forget Sally May, man. They, they, they're going to be there forever. Pay yourself first. And then I had another guy say, no, no, no. Get out of debt quickly. Whatever you make, pay off your debt. And, and then you can leave freely. Yeah. I, the hybrid route. You know what I'm saying? I came out and I wanted to work for somebody first, but I also wanted to do something on the side where I could have some kind of entrepreneurship um experience and so i i i worked for the spine surgeon but i also set up a medical consulting business where i was doing um, um device procurement and stuff like that and we can talk about that a little bit later so i met with with um companies that make implants orthopedic implants and i was helping them design you know plates hardware screws and stuff like that and so i was kind of doing that on the side trying to learn the business side that you don't learn in medical school um and so when uh, the, the opportunity came for me to start my own practice. I had a little bit of the clinical side and the entrepreneurship and administrative and the business side. So, you know, the short answer is no, I did not envision being quote unquote, my own boss and having my own practice practice initially because, because of the shock of debt, I wanted to have a guaranteed salary so I could pay off, pay off the debt. But then when the opportunity came, you know, like you said, yeah. time and opportunity, you blend those, you always want to be ready and just kind of go with it. Absolutely. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was gonna jump in because this this all kind of runs off back to what we call a mindset that people have because not everybody gets this right. right and this is part of the knowledge that we're trying to share out there which you kind of really embody is because if you sit in one place it's still a risk you know a, a freaking airplane can come crashing at you so you can sit down and say you know what i don't want to take on any debt 
and just go through life and just have a stable job. Absolutely. But then you can also say, stable job is great, but I want to build a legacy, which is kind of the approach that you're taking right here, right? You're not just getting the paycheck and fighting Sally Mae every day. You're like, you know what? Number one, I want to have consistency in my life, but then I want to get to the next level. Uh, how do you tell folks to maybe or show your folks that that mentality actually works better off than just the stable mentality? Because nobody wants to come out of school taking any major risk. They want to be able to at least get the depth of their back. Right. But then the reality sometimes is that there is good debt and there's bad debt. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and that you, you, you made the key point there. I mean, somebody once told me, you know, scared money don't make no money. You guys are money yeah. guys. Scared money, so, yep. <laughs> So it's the same. It's the same way with business and entrepreneurship. Man, you can, you can have your little guarantee here and and be comfortable working an eight to five. But at the end of the day, somebody could wake up on the wrong side of the bed and say, you know what? I don't like the way this dude looks anymore. We're gonna fire him. And then what are you gonna do? Um, they can, you know, they can get in trouble and their business get shut down. You have no control of that. And you have dependents, you know. Um, so for me, I always knew that I wanted a little bit of control as far as my destiny is concerned. Yeah, God is, you know, the, the, the author of our destiny is regardless, but he gives us choice and he gives us the wisdom to be able to, you know, make the right decision at the right time for the right reason. We just have to be ready because the opportunity is always there, right? And so I tell, you know, young physicians specifically today, you know, when I said I was gonna go start my own practice um, in 2018, I was told don't do it uh, because reimbursements are going down now. Um, they're, the lawyers are always there. Everybody's always trying to sue you. Um, and also the fact that, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of liability, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, apart from the cost is super yeah. high. Exactly. Costs, costs are going up, inflation is going up and reimbursements are going down. As I say, man, don't do it. Just go get a comfortable salary, work for a hospital and get your nine to five and get your 401k, you know, but if you don't, if you're not willing to take the risk, then you plateau at a certain level and there's no growth potential and mm. you can't be comfortable with that. If you're an entrepreneur, if you understand the business administrative side of medicine, then the trajectory is like this, you know what I'm saying? You're going like this, you're not plateauing at any point. You can decide to make as much money as you want to make and you can decide to work as much as you want to work. You know, nobody gets to dictate that. So if you're a young female and you want to start a family, you can start your own practice and say, hey, I want to work two days a week. I want to take care of my kids for three days. You can't do that when you're employed or you're owned by an entity. And if you're a hustler, if you're young, you know, young like Kenny and and, and you guys over here, and you say, <laughs> yeah. seven days, you have to work seven days a week and nobody can knock your hustle. So the freedom to be able to choose your lifestyle and what kind of work-life balance you want to have is something that money can't buy. The autonomy is priceless. Yeah, Absolutely. Shay, if I can jump in real quick. I think yeah. the fear, you know, taking that leap, it's one of the big, uh, big hindrance for a lot of people. Uh, the other thing is folks is like, how do I meet people? How do I find the right place? I mean, like, it's almost like the galaxies align for you. You know, you happen to meet someone in school through your artwork. Uh, it's not deliberate networking. It's just fluid. It's just comes naturally, right? And they say if you put in the work, uh, it's called the law of positive attraction. These things do happen because it wasn't like you were literally looking for a friend that would hook you up with this job in Texas. It right. just literally happened. That's the way God works, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I don't know what else to add to that. How did you survive that startup phase, though? Because I'm sure that's one of the most challenging parts. Yeah, so that, that's it's, it's challenging. You know, you get in there. You know, the first couple of months. You know, in private practice, you, you, you're you not paying yourself because you have staff, you have overhead, and your, your costs are fixed. The first day you start in, you know, a private practice, you might see one or two patients, but you got to pay for your receptionist, you got to pay for your scheduler, you got to pay for your manager, you got to pay, you know, your rent. Those costs are not going anywhere, right? Uh, so that's one of the, some of the things that that scare people from, from taking that leap and making that jump. Um, I'm not going to sit here in front like, you know, there, there wasn't some, some nights of anxiety, but you got to look at the goal. The more you want to set a goal for yourself and say, hey, this is what I want to do the first couple of months, this is what I want to do the first year. In two years, this is where I want to be. In five years, this is where I want to be. You set that goal. What the research shows is that 
you have that goal written down on paper somewhere, then you end up working towards that goal. But if you're just sitting there arbitrarily without any kind of goals, then you're just going to plateau at some point. So I knew that there was something bigger at the end of the road. And that's what I was looking at. And, you know, by God's grace, with a, with a, with a good support system, having a, a wife who was encouraging and also, you know, scientific minded and entrepreneurial. Um, I had a good support system and I was chugging along and I was able to do it without, you know, going into debt. I, I started my own practice. I financed it myself 100%. Oh, wow. I did nothing. Wow. I got all my equipment myself. And that's another thing that people, um, you know, make, makes people kind of want to pause a little bit is, you know, it, it can be capital intensive. But if you plan ahead of time, and that's the thing about the goal, right? I knew when I got my job as an employee, I wanted one day I wanted to be an employer. So I was planning for that day. So, you know what I'm saying? I put a little, put a little something, something on the side saying, you know, when the time is right, I didn't know when the day was going to be, but I knew when the time was right, I wanted to be prepared. And I didn't want to have to go ask anybody. Um, I'm Nigerian. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, when your father in Nigeria says, I own a house, they own that house. The bank don't own the house. They own the house. You know what I'm saying? Cash. Yeah. <laughs> Cash. Yeah. I my pops yeah. there. Got five cars, trust me, he got five cars. Ain't no, there ain't no bank on that car. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the I grew up with. And so I knew that one day when I'm ready, if I say I want a 5,000 square foot office with four treatment rooms and I want to have a digital x-ray machine, then I better have the money saved up for that. Now, it's, it's, not, it's not the only way to do it, okay? But that's where I wanted to do it because I knew coming out of uh, residency with a quarter of a million dollars in debt, that was kind of a noose on my neck that was kind of holding me back from some of the investments I wanted to do, some of the the, the risks I didn't want to take because I knew, hey, Sally Mae is watching me, man. If I default on anything, they're going to come get me. Uh, so yeah. right for that day, and when the opportunity came, I was ready. Yeah, it's, it's also yes, difficult uh, to have banks that will loan a business loan to, to a startup with such a high intensive uh, exactly. capital uh, exactly. requirement. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I just to I want to recap because you know it seems like it's just a balance of uh, various things that we talk about on the show here all the time, right? Um, preparedness, right, and having a vision, right. Even if it's just like even in your case where, yeah, you were not necessarily planning to have a practice, but when the opportunity came, it takes vision to kind of be able to switch your mind around and be like, I see the opportunity here. I'm going to take the risk, right? People, some people save up the cash, right? Which again, also speaks to that preparedness. And then when time comes to spend the cash, they're scared to spend the cash. You know, like you said, if you're scared of money, you don't make money. And uh, it seems that you had sort of like a, um, like a balance of these various things going. And it, it, it also seems to me like it just also comes from association, right? This the proximity principle, right? When you're around people who are doing the things that you're doing, you're more likely to advance in it significantly. Would you say that's like a sort of like a somewhat of a, an assessment of, of what you experience? Absolutely. I mean, I think you put it perfectly correctly. You know, um, you know, there's a there there are people who say you know, hey, send your, your kids to private schools because you need that network, right? If the right people at the right time, you're going to go somewhere, you know what I'm saying? But it also takes some drive and some planning on your part. I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, you know, silver spoon babies that, that have had all kinds of networks and didn't do anything with it, you know what I'm saying? So it takes a little bit of both, like you said, and you've got to be ready for that opportunity. The opportunity is always going to be there. If you're surrounding yourself with the right people and you're making the right plans, it's going to be there. You just got to be ready when it comes. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a faith guy. I believe God, you know, who, who, if, if he starts something, he's, he's faithful to, to complete it. But you got to be ready, though, because he's going to put it there for you. If you're not ready, then that's on you. Absolutely. Now, I have a question. Then I want to switch gears. Um, for you, uh, personally, and throughout your journey, you know, up to where you are right now, you know, you've accomplished quite a quite a few things, yeah. right? And uh, And I would add some very impressive things. Right. Um, what would you say has been the most difficult part for you throughout this journey or the most difficult experience? If you... Yeah, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about tort reform when we started this, this thing. Um, 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 one of the quote unquote unfortunate aspects of, of, of medicine is there are always people looking to take advantage of you. 
no matter how how good your intentions are wherever you look whether it's you know from hardware side or from or from wherever people come in and they understand that you you are the business and if you are the business they're always going to target you um, and 99 of the time most people have good intentions there are people who mm -hmm. actually their business model is to prey on physicians and try to take them out you know we've had patients come come in and try to pretend like they're slipping and falling so they can sue you and, and, and claim a medical liability that kind of stuff so for wow. me um it's having to deal with you know one subpoena after another and in, in, if you're a physician you get subpoenaed all the time you know most of the time nine out of ten times all they want is medical records they just want to know that you're you know you're doing what, whatever it is you're saying you're doing but every now and then you get a you know a fraudulent fraudulent uh, uh, claim that comes your way where somebody says you did A, B, and C, and you know for sure you didn't do that. Um, mm -hmm. Most physicians would want to fight that, but it costs more to fight it because your time is your money, right? You know, yeah. in a courtroom for 15 months, even if you know you do not hold this claim, you've done nothing wrong. Like I said, you know, in the beginning, we're not IT guys. We can't sit at home and make money. We literally, as a surgical specialty, you have to be touching somebody or cutting somebody open to make money. Um, and I know it's not about money, but it's about patient care and getting people well. Unfortunately, with a surgical specialty, in person, right now, at least in 2021, in person interactions and, and physical touch is our business model right now. Okay. Right. And so, a lot of times, you know, physicians just, you know, they just settle. They settle those cases because they know that. If they're not in the surgery center or in the hospital or in the operating room, then that's taking time and effort away from patient care. And my goal has always been to not just preserve life, but improve life for my patients. And if I'm not with them, um, then, you know, uh, I'm not doing anything. So when these fraudulent co claims come and they come all the time, you know, I had. Like, when you said they come all the time, can you, how frequently are we talking about? Because dude, I know, like, I know like, I know like doctors, get sued uh but like based on how you're explaining it to me right now it seems like it's quite a, a massive problem in that in that arena yeah. yeah texas is one of the most attractive states um for medicine because texas has a cap something called mm -hmm. tort law, where you know liabilities are capped at a certain number i'm not going to go into that i'll leave that to a little right. more. Um, so a lot of come here, but that, that doesn't stop them from trying i'll give you an example i'm a business owner i got three different emails last week um to my receptionist saying hey you know um i looked at your website and i saw that logo i designed that logo so i'm taking you to court and you owe me money i'm sitting there like what <laughs> my own boy made this up in, in our bathroom the other day you know in 2018 but literally three with 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 letters on a letterhead saying we're taking you to court and it's fraud, you know, but my, my receptionist, receptionist doesn't know that. When that comes to the fax machine, she's freaking out. Like, are we getting sued? Wow. Because I have that experience, I can talk about that. I get letters every day from Canada. You know, Absolutely. So, you know, uh, with fraudulent claims, you know, saying, hey, you need to send all this stuff and, and put your, your number here so we can get back to you. A lot of time is it's rubbish. But yeah, wait time from patient and we're having to do paperwork and you know patient care suffers because as a business owner and as somebody who has you know liabilities you have to take everything seriously you have to now take the time to go investigate it and i said yeah. 10 times is crap but that's time away from patient care absolutely yeah, so that means you gotta be you gotta be paying your lawyers a lot of money our money that's the other thing you gotta have lawyers man we got yeah. <laughs> definitely definitely have to have lawyers yeah, I, I'm going to switch gears now to be here to find out a little bit more about foot surgery, right? Because I cannot not ask about foot surgery, considering that I read about it quite a few times in your in your in your intro there. Um, but before we do that, okay, Kennedy, do you have any question before I switch it up? If you're gonna talk about foot, man, I better talk about my foot. <laughs> yes, let's talk about feet. Okay, let's talk about feet. <clears throat> so. Uh, I've been thinking of getting on OnlyFans, but currently the condition of my feet are not exactly the best, right? You know, so I need something that, you know, once I get up there, I can make some money. I'm kidding. But uh, foot and ankle surgery, um, how did you get into this? How did you, how, and why did this strike your interest? Yeah, so, I mean, I, like I talked about a little bit earlier on, I knew I wanted to do small joints. Right. 
either hand and wrist or foot and ankle. Um, and as a track star, you know, and a, and a soccer player in high school and middle school, you know, obviously I was using my foot and ankle a lot. And like I said, I had a really bad injury running track one day, which I think was an ankle fracture. We treated conservatively and I, you know, did some research, got some information and found out that there's a actual subspecialty. You can go, you can do uh, an orthopedic residency and do a foot and ankle fellowship, or you can do a podiatric medicine res residency and a, and a fellowship. And that's strictly and dedicated foot and ankle. And it intrigued me, I actually did, man. Um, I get, trust me, I get asked at least once a day from a new patient. Why right. you I mean, why, you, why would you want to do feet? You got a foot fetish? I'm like, man, somebody got to do <laughs> Hey, tell them you want to see everyone walking at all times. <laughs> like, I promise I ain't got no full fetish. I just somebody got to do it, man. I'd rather do that than look at mouth and butt and all that other stuff. I mean, that I, is I, true. It can get pretty bad. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 a subspecialty that is intriguing, and, and like I tell my patients, everybody got two feet, man. So there's enough to go around. We're going to be in business for a while. My wife yeah. and her, her real, you know, real housewives of of, of Dallas wear heels all day, every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, what is what is you know what is the most what would you say is the most exciting thing in the foot medical arena, if you will, something that is coming up for the future of your of your field? Orthopedics and bone and joint. The next level is you know um, um, what what are called biologics or autobiologics. In other words, stem cells. You know, mm -hmm. um, being able to regenerate tissue for thousands and thousands of years. You know, once once you lose cartilage in the joint. Cartilage is kind of the, the lubricant that helps joints glide together, right? You know, with osteoarthritis and, and arthritic conditions, once once the cartilage is gone, it's gone. You can't replace it. So, you know, for in our case, you have hip arthritis, you have to get a hip replacement. If you have knee arthritis, you have to get a knee replacement. In my case, if you have ankle arthritis, we replace your ankle or we fuse your ankle because there's just no way once you lose it, you know, once you lose it, it's, it's gone. Um, and so with biologics and stem cell therapy, there's a lot of intrigue that will, will, will be able to, you know, replenish and replace lost tissue that has never been able to be replaced in the past. And so there's a lot of mm. research going into those fields with you know, placental tissue, amniotic tissue from donated, you know, moms, you know, not, not dead babies. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy about that. We're not talking about, you know, any of those embryos or anything like that. Just normal tissue, for example, that, you know, females. Pause. I'm yeah. sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Let's roll back. Let's roll back to the dead babies part because I, th I think I just heard that. Can you tell me a little bit more about this before we move? Yes. Do, was, is there like a thing to collect this? Uh, yes. To collect cartilage from babies? No. Oh, the embryos. Yeah. The embryos. The reason, the reason I bring that up, it, it, it's, it's, it's controversial in, in America. Whenever you say stem cells, there are certain yeah. people that automatically assume that these are donated tissue from aborted babies okay i just want to clarify that in america it's still quote unquote illegal to use stem cells from aborted fetuses that's, that's all i'm saying so you know we get our our share of populations whatever i say hey you know we can do some stem cell therapy they're like oh no i don't, I don't want that that's from an aborted fetus i'm like no it's not that um you can get stem cell therapy from you i do stem cell therapy i mean i do what is called uh, uh, regenerative medicine if you look on my website uh, where mm -hmm. we can harvest you know stem cells from your own body and inject it into to seal, fill, and replace lost tissue in your body. And so there's, yeah. there's different aspects of it. There's, you know, something called bone marrow aspirate, which is very, very big in orthopedics, uh, where we harvest um, bone marrow and spin it down and then separate, you know, the, the, the stem cells of choice, and we can use that for treatment. And the idea is that, you know, God has made this, you know, amazing cell that can differentiate into whatever you want it to be. And so the research, right. you know, you know, tomorrow, if you if you lose an ear, you know, maybe we can harvest stem cells and that stem cell can regenerate into an ear or, or, or a limb or, or cartilage, in my case, where we, where we treat arthritic patients. So that's the future and that's where we're going. Are you guys going to go into, are you thinking is exo, ex, ex, extra skeleton, artificial intelligence, are you guys pushing towards that in your, in your industry as well? Oh, absolutely. AI technology is, is infiltrating every every aspect of medicine. I mean, yeah. we talked about, hey, trying to get my kids to code, man. I mean, it's, 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 it's in medicine for sure. Like I said, robotics is big in medicine. If you're 
general surgery, and if you do bariatric surgery or gynecological surgery, you, we use, they're using robots right now. And in orthopedics is coming uh, for sure, where you know a, a surgeon can be in you know in Lagos, Nigeria, somewhere, and if they have the right equipment, they can do surgery on somebody in in boat two, just playing with robots. Um, it's been tested, and it's the future for sure. I want to ask a question though. It's kind of related to all of this. I see a lot of kids these days. You know, back with, back in the day when we were young, we we do a lot of running around, getting on the bike, and a lot of kids these days have this uh, the tricycles. You know, they don't do all those physical activities that we did when we were much younger. Uh, do you think this is gonna have a long term effect or impact on their joints? Is this gonna in a way create more business for you guys? Yes, and, and it's, it's direct and indirect, you know what I'm saying? The, in, our, in our sub-segment here, I'm, I'm in Texas, and we have a Texas-sized uh, population. Uh, in other words, obesity is the problem, right? When you and I were growing up, I mean, I don't know about you, I ain't had no PlayStation, I ain't have no iPad with a bunch of games. You came back from school, you did your homework, and your mom was like, go outside and play. And you played until it, until it turned dark, right? And so there was, there was physical activity, you know what I'm saying? There was not a lot of sedentary play um and so with, with physical activity you're building muscles you're building you know um, um soft tissues and you're getting stronger um and then you're not quote unquote eating and, and sitting in a chair and playing video games all day so the obesity rate was in our generation was much lower um yeah. now kids are coming in eight nine ten eleven and they're nearly obese I mean, I seen a 15 year old the other day with arthritis. I'm like, how are you 15? You got arthritis already, you know, because there's a lot of pressure right. on the joints already from obesity and, and a sedentary lifestyle. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something that people are looking at now. And that's why there's a push by the American Academy of Pediatrics to get kids more into play, exercise, physical activity. Would you say that the, uh, the the scooters and those technologies that move people around without any real physical activity are a disadvantage to people's movement in the future? In my opinion, yes. Um, if you're sitting on an electric scooter, you're not, or an electric bicycle, you're not pedaling and physically powering that machine. You might as well be sitting down playing from PlayStation. Um, you're not recruiting those muscles and those muscles are not getting built up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it, there, there'd be some short-term and maybe long-term detriment to those kids. And again, it's all related to obesity and a lack of physical activity. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> you have a non-profit. I do. My Tell wife. us about that. So, yes, my, my wife is, uh, is, is the founder and president of Anadel Speaks. Um, Anadel Speaks is a uh, Christ-centered, Christian-based uh, nonprofit that helps um, kids, particularly female kids who are victims of sexual abuse. Uh, I know the word victim is not kosher anymore, so I'll say survival, survivors of, of, of sexual abuse. And the idea is to help rescue and educate. And so the nonprofit goes into schools, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and educates teachers parents and counselors that, you know, um, sexual abuse is real, it happens. Um, a lot of African countries is taboo to talk about it and a lot of black and brown folks is taboo to talk about it. And we wanna put that out there that, you know, if you surveyed um, the typical African female, at some point she's been touched inappropriately in her life. Mm -hmm. that, and it happens with young boys too. And so we wanna put the light out there and, and take the veil off this quote unquote taboo topic in, in our community and say, hey, there's a resource out there. And so we've partnered with Safe Step. Safe Step helps to introduce curriculums into schools um, from pre-K all the way up to what we call uh, secondary school or um, high school. And right. the idea is to educate them on what good touch and bad touch it is and, uh, and to also let them know that there are resources available um, and to hopefully prevent you know, this dark cloud from perpetuating in our communities. Absolutely. I think that that is amazing. Uh, especially, like you said, in the Black community and the African community, there are certain things that are not spoken about. Um, they don't do things like get counseling and so on and so forth. And I think that that's really important. And uh, the sooner we can all join efforts to do something like that, that is, that is really uh, a game changer. Now, how long have you been, how long have you been in that? And, and what are some of your plans there? Yeah, the 
nonprofit. My wife is actually the the, the boss lady. I'm, I'm I play more of a support supportive role. It's her vision. All right. Um, laid up on, on our heart for years and years. She talked to me about it many years ago. Um, and we are in two schools right now in Nigeria. We're doing a fundraiser here in Dallas. Uh, we'll be doing another fundraiser in, in Houston um, to kind of you know raise awareness, also raise funds, and then help um, people back home to to on the medical side, on the awareness side, and also on the education side. And so, mm-hmm. Ubek, Ubek is uh, the main entity in Nigeria that works with all the public schools from pre-K all the way to secondary school. And we want to get into the public school system and kind of raise awareness and educate them. Um, so it's been going on for, for, for two years now officially, um, but our first uh, main fundraiser is not in the next couple of months. It's incredible. So how can someone find more about this? Can you ask a uh, website? Absolutely. So uh, anadelspeaks.org, A-N-A-D-E-L, like you see right here, speaks, mm. S-P-A-K-S dot O-R-G is the website for, for the foundation. Um, my website is anadelcenter.com. Uh, com. That's just a foot and echo uh, clinic here in the Dallas area. But I definitely encourage you to go, go on the, the website for the foundation. Please support us. We're raising awareness and uh, we need uh, a lot of support from the community. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Nyere, as we approach the end here, I have one burning question for you. Burn it's got to be burning, right? Burn yeah, it's going to be burning, man. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got this, man. Okay, he's, he's, he's the food doctor, man. He's the chairman. Man. He's, he's the chairman. The, yeah, exactly. It's missing the now. chief title now. I'm a chief. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> chief doctor. It's chief doctor. <laughs> All right. So here it is. What is your definition of success? What does it mean to you? Oh man, that's that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, success. What is success for me? It's 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 simple. You know, having a plan having a goal, setting that goal and reaching that goal. That's success. No matter how minutia it is or minute it is. You know, if my goal is to wake up today and, and you know, g- give my kids a hug and tell them I love them twice a day. If I do it, yeah. if my goal is to one day make it to the Young Successful Podcast, I set a goal and I get that invitation, hey, mama, I made it. That's success. Oh. Hey it's man, mama, it's okay. I mean, it's it's That's okay, a rap man. Song, by the way, it, it's it's okay, man. We we listen, man. We we helped you make this one come true. There you go. Hey, hey. I'm on TV, man. I made it. So yeah, we 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 we're, we're trying to stay humble right now, man. The glory is too powerful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm not gonna complicate it at all. This for, for every aspect of life, for everything that you do, you know. It's important to have a vision, set a goal, and work towards that goal. And when you get there, you're successful. I mean, certain goals are, are uh, I'm not going to see here in front and say that, you know, every goal that everybody, you know, attains, I mean, sets out to, they're going to attain. And it doesn't mean that if you don't attain the goal, it's a failure. Those mm-hmm. two can, can be, you know, uh, self evident and true at the same time. But yeah. setting that little goal and, and working towards it, and as long as you're on that journey, every day is a success. That is really that is really interesting how you put that because first of all, clear and concise. I don't think I've ever gotten a much more direct answer for what success is. And really what I really like about that answer is the simplicity because it's easy to follow. Mm-hmm. Right? You have a plan, put in the work, and you get to your goal. As long as you're on that journey, you missed that yeah, part of it though. Absolutely. You have to get up every day and get after it, right? Uh, and then, of course, there is a whole side of failure as well. Now, uh, for this one, I'm just going to share my thoughts on what I think failure is and Ogakeni, which I'm into. I think that failure, right, as the way I kind of look at things is that we're all already in this state of failure, right? So this would mean that there is no other direction but up, right? And the reason why I define it this way in my mind is because I was always trying to take away the power of and the fear of failing, right? So the way I look at it is that if I was going to do something and I don't do it, automatic fail, guaranteed fail. I was already at fail. And if I don't do it because I was scared, well, nothing has changed. Wouldn't that be negative fail? 
<laughs> right. Well, hey, look, if you go do it and it does not work out, there's only two options. You can find yourself in a worse position if it exists. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but think about this. If you're ever trying to do anything to change where you currently are, it's because you're really not really happy with where you are. If you're not happy with where you are, you're failing. So anything you do can only make you better. What do you guys what do you guys think of that? We'll begin with you, Dr. Nair. Hey, man, that give us the doctor answer. Yeah, it's about, <laughs> hey, look, man. It's my to drop the seeds, man. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, man. I, I, I think that's again, that's that's pretty simple and, and, and concise, man. Like, I'm right. I'm a, right? I, I got two little boys here. And I think if my kid was to ask me about failure, I think that's you know, that that's the same way I would explain it. And same thing if I was talking to Elon tomorrow, I would explain it the same way. And and, and the yeah. good thing about that way you explain it is doesn't matter who your audience is. If you if you break it down to that level, they can at least get something out of it and 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 be inspired by it. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, the goal is to inspire somebody to do something that they otherwise would not have done. And if yeah, you know, it's holding you back. If you define it that way, then it might not hold you back. Beautiful. Okay, Kenny. What are your thoughts hey, on that? Chief, I've spoken. I'm not adding to it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> look, hey, go on. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I just wanted to get you guys take on that one. Well, okay, Kenny. What any other thoughts, questions before we close this one out? Yeah. Um, so they call me the farmer on the show because apparently I like to plant seeds. Um, so I I would just literally just maybe say that you know we're looking at Doctor Nero, Chief Doctor Nero, Chairman. Yes, we've officially dubbed you Chief. The the guy at the top. Yeah, and I have to say, for him to be where he's at now, and I'm still sure he's still climbing up that uh, success journey, um, he must have planted a lot of seeds. So if you're out there wondering, hey man, this guy has such a long introduction, how do I get there? I just say go plant the seeds somewhere, and uh, not watch it grow, but put some work at it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It is a testament of the hard work, and the, the that intro, as you saw, it's the result. It's, it's, it's the how would you say is the end result, right? The success, right? So it shows like you've done what you're doing and here it is. Yeah. So you put in the plan and put in the walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Well, as we close this one out, then we're going to have you last have the uh, final word here. Dr. Neri, what message would you like to send out to the world? Anything go for yeah, it. Absolutely. I, I would like to say that, you know, African, you know, it takes a village, you know, so nobody does anything on an island. Um, have have a good support system, you know, have faith, trust God. Like I said, I'm not where I am today without a good foundation and a good support system. My parents, you know, my family members, my wife, my wife is a visionary. If you've met her, you know, then I die. Some of you might not know what I'm going to die is, but you know, go <laughs> 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 visionary and she's been my partner and she's been my you know ride or die and having a good foundation and having you know um a good family system and having faith you can have a plan you can have all of that stuff but nobody is successful on an island by themselves people have yeah. mentors, have support systems and it takes a good village i mean if anybody tries to tell you that they made it on their own they're talking crap don't believe it yeah you know, takes a village and, and the, having a good support system, you know, you talked earlier on about, you know, timing and opportunity. It makes a difference. You just got to be ready when your opportunity comes. So keep the faith. Absolutely. It's coming. Incredible. Dr. Nere, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't think I could close it out any better. Please like, share, subscribe. Check out Dr. Nere's uh, nonprofit. We're going to have the links in the description. To the clinic as well and to the nonprofit, and like share our videos and subscribe until next time cheer out peace double o out